The topic of this tech talk is ESA async and await, or how to rewrite our asynchronous functions. I will demonstrate their use and then teach them ES6 with the goal of explaining how async and await can be implemented in ES6. Let's take a look at the new syntax. On the left is an example of composing promises as we are used to in a dummy function, our async function. On the right is the same function rewritten with async and await. The ES8 version is conveniently labeled with an async function by the keyword async, and inside, everything that returns a promise displaced after the keyword await. So we read, let data equals the await of get async ID, and then return the await of run async on the data. In both cases, our async function uses and returns promises. In both cases, we are allowed to work with variables inside the function as if they were actually there, while in reality, each value is held inside a promise. Therefore, both our async functions can be used in practically the same way. They are invoked and then promise changed to do more work. The difference between these two is that the code looks more like any old asynchronous function. So imagine if we were to cut out the awaits on the right, we would read, let data equals get ID, return, run data. This makes it fairly beginner friendly for somebody who does not know much about promises and is new to coding. Now, let's look at how not to use async and await. On the left, we see a beginner mistake with await. Here, we are trying to await our async function in synchronous code and want to log its output. But this forgets that the output is really a promise for value in the future. So the code actually logs a promise. Because of this, await can only be used inside async functions. On the right, we can easily fix this problem by just using our async function inside another async function. Do something async. Logging inside do something async will return the output value as intended. Following is another example of what won't work. On this slide, we want to make a series of database instances, but serially. In makeDB entries, we map over a data array and await the create method used on each entry. But it won't work. Here await is not being explicitly used inside makeDB entries because map is actually a synchronous array method as we know. Here, await will throw a syntax error. So how can we make our database entries? On the left, make database entries now iterates manually through data array by using a for of loop. This looping works. Await is used inside the async function itself. On the right is an example where we want concurrent async calls. Here we have the function reformat async that takes a data array and transforms it into text. The map method works fine because only the completed away is rated. Below, let's look at the patterns of await that are used in both of these cases, left and right. In serial executions, await is used in separate expansions, that is to say, in separate lines. But for parallel, await is used multiple times in the same single expression. So return await of x, await y. The result is that native async await looks simple and concise with no bluebird. Now, that's how to use async await. Let's move on to try to understand what's going on under the hood. Let's start with introducing iterator functions. An iterator function makes iterators, which are just objects with a next method. On the left, let's make a counter. The iterator function make counter returns an object with a start value and a method next that will in return a count and increment it. To make the iterator, invoke make counter with a start value. And to have it return a new count, you can just next it. This counter will return 10, 11, and 12, and so on. There's a complication, however, that I need to teach you. Because iterators should follow MDN's iterator protocol, all that means for us is that the return value will be packaged in an object. So it will have a key value, and the answer will be there. On the right is almost the same countermaker function, except that it returns this object. The object will also have a done property, which is very nice, because it holds information about whether or not the iterator should still be nexted. Let's move on to something else you should know about generator functions. Excuse me. Let's move on to generator functions. A generator is also an iterator function. They return an iterator object. But generators do not directly return an iterator literal. 
Instead, now that we have this generator code, which defines how the iterator will behave. The iterator is made for us automagically behind the scenes. On the left, we have an asterisk that marks make counter as a generator function. And we can read, let count equals start, and while count is lesser than or equal to 20, yield the count. The yield keyword here, in effect, marks when the iterator should be returning a value to the code that runs the counter. This is what makes it seem like the, code, like the generator code can pause and resume, which is pretty cool. So moving on, we can invoke make counter to make a counter, and then we can use a while loop to look at the values. And we can just dot next, therefore, until the iterator is done. This code, as you can see on the right, will output 10 through 12. Please notice that the counter iterator uses the iterator protocol in its output. Also notice that the generator function determines when the counter is used up. That is to say, when count.done is true. And now one more thing that we need to know about generators. More about generators. While yield expressions are an output for an iterator, they actually also serve as an input location back into the code. The code using the iterator can input values by providing a parameter into the following .next method call. In effect, that value will be plugged into the next segment of the generator code. So on the left here is a generator function, two-way street. It takes an initial parameter x and yields it times two. An inputted value will replace that expression entirely and be multiplied times five, and it will become the value of x. Now on the right, let's track the output of the invocation and usage of that iterator. x is inputted as two, and the yield value of x times two gives four. The expression in parens, yield x times two, is an input location, and it will be entirely replaced by the value of five. The value of five therefore becomes five times five, or 25. It is not the same as the yield value of four times five, or 20. And that's the important key uh, idea that I would like you to take away here. Therefore, the next returned output of this iterator with a done of true will have the value of x plus y equals 27. This two-way street behavior is central to why generators are a useful tool. Moving on, but why do we want to use a generator function in this way? On the left here, we have the same ESAR async function that I've already shown you in previous slides. On the right, we have that same async function rewritten in ES6. Here, it is using the library co. This syntax is therefore necessarily an example of how async and await can be implemented to work behind the scenes to hide promise chaining. Here we see, in particular, the co library's wrap function, which will wrap and execute our async code, which has the form of a generator function. We can read, let data equals the yield of get async by a D, then return the yield of run async on our data. Notice that each yielded expression is a returned promise. That promise, in turn, needs to be inputted back into the generator code in the exact same location by the following call on its iterator. But now we know how to make that happen, as we saw in two-way street from the previous slide. So let's take a look at how Co can manage to do all of that work. Here is a mock of how Co manages and uses a generator function, ignoring complications and error handling. First, Co.wrap returns a function that is primed to invoke the generator, which creates an iterator, and sets Co to run that iterator immediately. And now the meat of the matter. Co starts the first dot next that needs no parameters. Next, if there were only one yield in our generator code, then the output would already be done. So we would just return that value, making sure to return a promise. But for every extra yield in our generator code, Co needs to chain off of the yielded promise and again run it in the iterator by nexting it. If resolved underneath there is a success handler that is a little bit different than any we've worked with before. It is a recursive success handler. It will take care of the nexting with the output response of the last promise, returning it if done, and then recursively calling itself until there are no more yields to reach in the generator function. So when done, Co returns the promise, and it will bubble up through these recursive calls. At that point, the async function is completed. So what do co.wrap and generators teach us about async and await? 
in essence, a sink and a wait work together to execute a seemingly possible function where the thenable nature of promises are abstracted away. And that concludes the body of my tech talk. Here are my sources and a couple of more things I'd like to leave you with. Exploring JX has a great free ebook which covers anything you could want to know about ES7 and 8. And there's one more thing that's really good to know about. That's ES Next. It is a collection of all proposals that might be included in the NEC ECMAScript. And those proposals are just a click away on GitHub. So I suggest that you just take one at random and get your feet wet with ES Next. And finally, I want to challenge you to teach yourself ES7 in 30 seconds. Thank you.